with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, June 13th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jefferson Morley, editor of the JFK Facts blog, author of Scorpion's Dance, The President, The Spymaster, and Watergate. Also on the program today, Senate Gang of 20 announces an anemic gun control deal. Meanwhile, it is day two of the January 6th commission hearings. And in Idaho, 31 white supremacists charged with planning a riot at a pride event. Meanwhile, Proud Boys assault a drag queen reading hour at a library and at other events, I guess, uh, pride events around the country. Colorado law now allows collective bargaining for county workers, though they can't yet strike. The FDA apparently paused inspections during COVID and baby formula plants went to hell. Washington Post investigation shows Israeli soldiers very much likely the killer of an American Palestinian journalist. French elections have their second round of voting on Sunday as Macron's centrist party may be overtaken by the leftist Melanchons coalition. Is it noops? I don't know how to say it. Noupes? I don't know. Just do an accent. Noupe. Noupe. Sarah Palin leads <laughs> in a special election uh, up in Alaska. Good news for us. We'll advance to the final election in August where it's a runoff by four of the 48 candidates who run, who ran, I should say. And the Supreme Court begins to hand down its uh, terms, uh, decisions. The major ones are coming, we are expecting, on Wednesday. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. It is Monday at the beginning of the week, and with us... Emma Vigeland, we're getting reports of uh, the sound fading in and out on the app, uh, at the very least, on the audio. Might be the filters. I don't know about that. Uh, noise reduction compression is too intense. Yeah. It's chopping up the sound. Okay. Uh, we will get on that. Sorry, folks. Don't know if that's happening in the context of uh, the video as well. Are we fixed on that? Uh, let's try that. Maybe that was the uh, problem. I don't know. Hopefully that, unless it's a connection issue. We got some weird noise gate thing going on. The music cuts out when you take a breath. Hey. Can you start over? We missed the intro. Okay, we're going to start over the show. If no one can hear any of that, we're going to have to do it again. All right, we will be right back, folks. <laughs>
Jeff Cena. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cena. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cena. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, June 13th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, again, it's Jefferson Morley, editor of the JFK Facts blog, author of Scorpion's Dance, The President, The Spymaster, and Watergate. Meanwhile, Senate Gang of 20 announces an anemic gun control deal. It is day two of the January 6th commission hearings. In Idaho, 31 white supremacists charged with planning a riot at a pride event in that very same state. Meanwhile, Proud Boys assaulting drag queen reading hour at a library south of San Francisco, attacking other uh, pride events around the country. In Colorado, new law allows collective bargaining for county workers, though they're not allowed to strike. During COVID, FDA paused inspections for almost two years and baby formula plants went to hell. Washington Post investigation shows Israeli soldiers were more than likely the killers of the American Palestinian journalists last month. French elections have their second round of voting this coming Sunday as Macron's centrist party may be overtaken by Melanchon's leftist coalition, New Pays. Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin leads in the <laughs> special election in Alaska, advances to the final election in August, runoff of four candidates. Supreme Court starts to drop uh, some of its uh, decisions today. All the major ones are coming, we believe, on Wednesday. Stay tuned. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is our second go-through on Monday. We had some audio problems just a moment uh, before. We have resolved those. We had switched computers and blah, blah, blah. But it is Monday. Happy to be here. Thanks for starting off the week with us. And speaking of us, here is Emma Vigeland. Hi. There she is. Yes. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Yep, that's me. Yep. Hi. All right. There we go. Rangers lost the series out of the playoffs. Did you know that? You know what? I did. and uh, But I only knew it because I saw some guys getting punched because of it. Oh, yes. Some guy from Staten Island uh, completely sucker punched a Lightning fan. I respect the Lightning and also, of course, never do that over anything, especially a sports game. But like when I went to the first playoff game, and I will keep this short, because it's very sad that they're out, but it was a magical run. And when I went to their first uh, postseason game, they like started chants for like, which borough are you from? And Staten Island was definitely the loudest. And I was like, oh, this fan base is different than uh, other fan bases in New York. Like if I go to a Knicks game, Staten Island is not going to be the number one borough represented at MSG. Um, so yeah, screw that guy. But anyway. Yep. Screw that guy. Um, Banned for life from the stadium. I, I remember taking uh, uh, my daughter to a Patriots uh, Giants game, yeah. and as we were leaving, because you know my daughter got into it, she put like the black plane under her eyes. She had the Gronk uh, shirt on, and she was very excited. And uh, then I got yelled at by two uh, women, and I think like in their thirties. Like, how <laughs> it was could a, you bring it that? It was kid? a preseason game. It was a preseason game yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so 
But I used to uh, come down as a kid to uh, the bleachers against the uh, Yankees, Red Sox, and that got a little heated too. But uh, yeah, but like the concept of a old a woman who is an adult yelling about your child being a fan is uh, unhinged. Unhinged. A little bit unhinged. Yeah. You just get like a glimpse into people's mob mentalities when they take those things that seriously. Yep. Uh, folks, as you know, I wasn't here last week. I had both. There was a. It was a little bit of a coincidence. Uh, I was scheduled to be on Wednesday, but half my tooth fell off yeah. uh, and I had to run around uh, and figure out a way of getting the cap back on. Apparently you can also, which I did not know at the time, you can go to this, to like CVS or whatever. There's the drug glue. Store and you get glue. Yeah. And glue, but I, I didn't know that. And uh, cause I was en route to uh, Worcester for a Worcester. I don't even know how to explain it, but it was some event where like, People who grew up in Worcester or were affiliated with Worcester, maybe they went to college in Worcester, were invited back to see changes in the city. And I basically just went because I want to see a buddy of mine from high school uh, who is now a president of an HBCU in South Carolina. And uh, he was at the time president of our class and wow. I was a VP. Um, and uh, I am not a VP of any uh, institution <laughs> at this point. I'm but, surprised that you were able to take a back seat to him. Get the team he, back he, together. You know what? He's he's a very charismatic guy. Um, but um, very interesting guy, too, actually. But we, we got to watch the Celtics game together. But we also went around to um, a bunch of, uh, of stuff in Worcester that was uh, fascinating. And um, there's, there is going to be something, too, that, that came out of that that I think we're going to be able to talk about on this show. Uh, but... Um, We'll wait on that. But he lived in housing in Worcester that, you know, uh, I guess it was, I don't remember what it was. Six months ago, it was a year ago, when the the question of highways as being racist came oh, up. Yeah. I can't remember in what context. Pete His, Buttigieg brought it up, I, I think, think, in the context of infrastructure. Yeah, we will. We will. Um, his story. I mean, he sort of lived it. And. um and uh, he, he pointed out a documentary to me uh, about it. Maybe we'll, we'll get into that. But um, so that, that's where I was on Thursday and Friday. Uh, once the tooth thing got fixed, um, you know, I, I, I had this other event that I had to go to. So um, there it is. All right, folks, uh, we will get into uh, this now. Um, over the weekend, Senator Murphy uh, from Connecticut announced on Twitter that they had reached a bipartisan deal because the most important thing in the world that we get a bipartisan deal. Now, what's the deal? Well, it's a bad deal. It's how it's you no come deal. to the deal. It's the friends you make along the way in the bipartisanship, not the uh, actual substance of the legislation itself. Um, and here we go. Let's do this. We reached a compromise over the weekend um, that will save lives. Um, I understand that part of the news here is the breakthrough, because I think you're right. This does allow us to um, uh, break this log jam, and it allows us to be set up for future success. But the content of this compromise in and of itself will save lives. The ability to help states pass red flag laws will stop thousands of suicides and homicides. The closing of the boyfriend loophole means that uh, Domestic abusers, boyfriends that beat up their girlfriends, won't be able to buy guns. Um, the um, protections for 21 and under buyers, that means that um, there's a pause for any 18 to 20 year old who is going into a store to try to buy an AR-15, like the Uvalde shooter, an ability for the police department to intervene. And then the mental health spending is going to be transformative in and of itself. We're talking about billions of new dollars for mental health, uh, a lot of it going to underserved communities. That's going to save lives too are very reasonable and the all right so that's uh i mean there's there's the deal and it is i mean it remains to be seen that it's going to do those things frankly <clears throat> um if there is a uh even a slight bit i guess there is some value in it although you know it is very hard to get past the idea that they're doing this to make it look like they're doing something and and let's be clear, the, imp the impediment to them doing something is the Republican Party, period, end of story. Let's talk about the 10 people, the 10 Republicans who signed off on this. Roy Blunt of Missouri, 
Roy Blunt of Missouri is retiring. Again, I mean, we've said this many times on this program that the only way you get to see um, how you get to see a Republican do anything worth anything for anyone else is if their political career is either so ironclad that they are completely safe and secure or they're they have ended their political career. So Roy Blunt of Missouri retiring. Richard Burr of North, North Carolina retiring. Rob Portman of Ohio retiring. Patrick Toomey of Pennsylvania retiring. Tom Tillis of North Carolina retiring. John Cornyn of Texas. Maybe he can threaten a federal judge again. Was it him who threatened the federal judge on the uh, uh, on the uh, floor of the Senate? I don't know about maybe ten years ago. But he is uh, in Texas. He's pretty locked up and safe. Susan Collins and Lindsey Graham, they got elected uh, two years ago. Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, same situation. Um, it is only Mitt Romney. Although he just got reelected too, didn't he? Yeah. Well, I, I, how brave, how courageous of, of, of Mitt Romney. There. And they have signed off on something that is in, incredibly weak. Now, the alternative... Could be, let's not uh, pursue this window dressing. Let's remind the American public that the impediment to any type of progress in the killing machines that are being sold to anybody at any time that are responsible for the deaths of 40,000 people a year in this country, the only impediment to in any way restricting the, the sales of these killing machines are the Republican Party. I guess people can decide which they think is more important. Um, but if you think this is going to lead to further reform, that this is one of those things, a small crack in the dam could open up a big hole, I present to you Representative Chris Jacobs of that deep, deep, deep red state, New York, where um, this is what happened when he came out and even mentioned any type of gun reform. Are very reasonable. And the backlash against you was intense from your fellow Republicans. After that, you decided that you were not going to seek another term in Congress. What has that backlash been like? Well, I, I very quickly, uh, uh, many of the elected officials who had endorsed me for my reelection, which I think I had a very good, um, solid uh, path to victory, uh, withdrew their endorsements. Many of the committees did so as well. And uh, so as uh, over the next week, week and a half, as, as things heated up on that, I, I just felt that um, it would be very divisive uh, for the party uh, to uh, pursue running and also divisive because I thought there was a high likelihood of outside groups coming in yeah. and that this issue would be the issue of the race and it wouldn't be a, a, a productive dialogue. It would just be running ads and uh, kind of misinformation on, on issues. And I really want to be a positive force on this issue so we can get meaningful change. So I guess the obvious question is, if you want to be a positive force on the issue and you want to get meaningful change, why not stay and fight the fight? And why not send a signal that it is worth fighting for from your perch in Congress and not saying, well, I'm going to leave because... Well, I'm, I'm here for seven more months, and I think there's a lot uh, this week. We, Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I, I can't tell people that the Republican Party is completely bad crap crazy because this is also how I'm going to make some money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Got to cash so, in later. I'm going to uh, slink off, but I'm also um, not going to not want to uh, get some money in my bank account. I should also say, just say, um, uh, correction, Tom Tillis not retiring. Um, he is in the column of just got reelected. Right. Sorry, it was my fault. So there will be six, um, uh, six, um, uh, the, uh, he's got like four years before that comes around. And so, like, let's also just be clear here, too. Yeah, I think he in uh, 20, his term ends in, uh, at the end of tw uh, 2026, I believe, um, from my, my quick Google search. Like, the bill is so meaningless. I mean, the only, it would have addressed in these narrow circumstances these two mass shooters in Buffalo, I believe, 
and Uvalde, given the background checks for 18 to 21. But none of this is really enforced. Like the red flag laws that are being proposed, more money to states to enact red flag laws. From what we understand right now, that means it's just voluntary. So most Mississippi, Tennessee, red states that already don't want to do this kind of crap, they're just going to be like, no federal mandate? Fine, we'll take your money and reallocate it elsewhere. I mean, it doesn't seem like there's an enforcement mechanism on it. And oh, even if there gonna, is, that money, then they God just won't take the money. money. Yeah, yeah they, they won't take the money. How about these mental health services, this this money that's going to go to that? We don't have universal health care in this country. Like, community centers. You think that's going to be allocated properly in a way that's going to actually c- combat this issue? I mean, frankly, as you say, the value in saying we're not going to push this garbage through might be better than voting for something that's not going to do anything. We, and we'll see. I mean, the House has a much more aggressive bill, and so we'll see if they can come to terms. But the you, you mentioned the, the money for um, uh, mental health. They're not even clear where they're going to find that. And um, much of this seems even the even the uh, background checks on um, uh, on, uh, on uh, under 21 year olds, pre- presumably between 18 and 21, is only contingent upon the background checks that exist in that state already. Yeah. And we don't know uh, which state has any of those anyways. And uh, also the average mass shooter is 30 years old. Like the I get like the need to like raise an age or something like that. But that's really all that's going to do is stop the spectacle of the school uh, slaughter and we'll get more, you know, grocery store ones. I, I, mean, yeah. I am convinced a, you know, a federal 60 day waiting period would probably save, you know, I, I, I don't I, I don't know how to put a number on it, but 30,000 people a year kill themselves. And. Um, gosh knows how quickly they decide they get the gun and they decide to kill themselves. And I then, don't know what the time it and is. And it's also that, just the manufacturing yeah. of assault weaponry, weapons of war in the United States. You have to target the selling of those kinds of weapons or this is garbage. It's trash. All right. Uh, we got a, a couple of words from our sponsors uh, today, and then we will be talking to Jefferson Morley editor of the JFK's Flax blog, author of Scorpion's Dance, The President, The Spymaster, and Watergate. Um, oh, today's program sponsored by, oh, where is it? Here it is. Okay. I can, I this, can hold it this up. This really is the, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, Emma because I had this from when you were out. Vanna Viglund. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Established Titles is a project uh, based on the historic I'm Scottish custom this. where landowners, landowners are called lords and ladies. And uh, sadly, we have that custom in this country, too, with the uh, landowners. Uh, Lord, you're my landlord. I told people on Friday, Sam, or or later this week, that you make us call you Lord around the office now. I do. Well, and sometimes I switch up because I also have my lady uh, one, too. Yes. Uh, Established titles allows you to sometimes I do the beginning of the week. I'm the Lord. And by uh, end of the week, I'm a lady. And it just freaks everybody out. They're so confused. I know. How is that possible? Crowder's even more afraid You can't even define a lady. (laughs) Established titles allows you to ceremoniously purchase as little as one square foot of of dedicated land in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. This is real. It's very Scottish sounding. So so, uh, So you can call yourself a lord or lady. Put that on your resume. Try and get into college. I'm a lord. Uh, you get an official certificate with a crest, as you can see there. Uh, mm. Thank you. Please uh, show that. A unique plot number, and they let you see exactly where your plot is located. You could go visit it. That would be wow. actually be a great trip. <laughs> I'd like to bring my whole family and show them my, what I lord over in, yeah. in Scotland uh, and what I lady over. Uh, for each one sold, this is the best part, established titles plants a tree to protect the beautiful, pristine woodlands of Scotland. They also partner with organizations that are doing environmental work all over the world, like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. So this is a great gift. It's funny, and it's actually doing some good. Established Titles is fun. It's a new way to preserve the picturesque woodlands and biodiversity of Scotland. And you, you also support the uh, global uh, deforestation or reforestation efforts. Makes a great last-minute gift, especially on Father's Day, which is coming up soon. Established Titles are running a big Father's Day sale right now. You can get an additional 10% off when you go to EstablishedTitles.com slash majority. Use the code majority. 
That's establishedtitles.com slash majority. Coupon code majority saves you an extra 10%. The link is in the description. Honestly, uh, one of the best g- gifts I've gotten. The, the other one was uh, semi-nude that John Benjamin had painted of himself fit into a classic oh, right. uh, picture, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, also, uh, another sponsor of today's program, longtime sponsor of the show, Grove Collaborative. Did you know, and I didn't know this, only 9% of plastic actually gets recycled? Doesn't matter how much we put in our recycling bin. Ugh. It's all lies. It is, it is time to ditch single-use plastics for good. And, uh, in fact, by 2025, Grove is going to be 100% plastic-free. And Grove makes it super easy to do this. They have laundry care. They have hand soaps. They have more. They carry hundreds of products, aims at replacing single-use plastics across every room of your home and, he- and head-to-toe personal care routine. Grove uh, has concentrated cleaners. They have refillable glass bottles, which are friendlier to the planet, twice as effective as the leading natural brands. Over 2 million households already rely on Grove uh, Co. for safe formulas and refillable packaging that never compromise on performance. I am almost now fully across the board uh, Grove glass hand um, pumps for uh, hand soap. Got one for the kids that foams because they like the foaming one. I, I like it too. All right. Well, I'm maybe a little sw- we'll switch something out here in the office. <laughs> Satisfying. Um, and they also have they have you know all glass ones, and then they have glass with the silicon in there, which I use around with the kids. You're gonna break it, <clears throat> and so uh, which they haven't, but it prevents them from doing so. And also, I use a uh, Grove uh, cleaner. I think we got one here actually, hmm. where it's um, glass bottle. Silicon base, and they have orange concentrate cleaner, and um, it is my everyday cleaning uh, thing. I also got from Grove their um, uh, their all-purpose disinfecting cleaner, which is also super effective. But uh, I've got the everyday in the glass bottle. Check it out, folks. Uh, Grove.com/majority. You'll get a free gift worth a uh, gift set worth up to fifty dollars. With your first order. Plus, shipping is fast and free. So get started right now at grove.com slash majority. Grove.com slash majority. All sorts of great uh, cleaning and, I guess, beauty products uh, there. And all natural stuff. It's really a one-stop shopping place. We'll put the link in the YouTube and podcast description. And lastly, our final sponsor of the day. You can get a free trial at aura.com slash majority. Do you know what the fastest growing crime is in America? Identity theft. Yep. Well, you've heard it. I've heard it. Yeah. Should I play dumb next time? No. What is it? It's it's identity theft. Okay. You guessed it. Um, The crime rate has been surging. It goes up every day. I get like a phishing uh, uh, text or email. Oh God. I actually enjoy that, but uh, a lot of times people get ripped off by it. Um, It happens to one in twenty Americans. Identity theft. And despite that, everybody seems to be completely blindsided by it when it happens. You get shocked. And then, you know, you got to imagine, you log into your email, you realize that the, someone has changed the password. You start getting notifications activity from your bank, your credit cards, whatever, your crypto accounts, maybe. And that's when all of a sudden you start to feel a little panic. You start to feel some anxiety. You start to feel some guilt, paranoia, shock, anger. And uh, you want to avoid all that. Never mind the massive, massive hassles that's involved in trying to deal with that after the fact. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aura. They are sponsoring uh, this program today. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software, all combined into one easy-to-use app. It's basically, you know, like sort of, you know, that Swiss cheese type of thing. Like you get, you cover all your bases. Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers, sends you alerts fast right to your phone and email. When it comes to fraud, every second matters. You can connect your credit card and bank accounts and get notified of any changes up to four times faster than Aura's competitors. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online, keeps your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. Their antivirus software will block malware and viruses before they infect your devices. 
You can protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aura for free for two weeks. See if any of you or your family's personal information has been compromised. You put your email address in there and they'll tell you. It has been, you know, this place has been hacked in, whatever, you know. I don't know. Popsicles.com. You go there to order your popsicles. And this place has been hacked. So change your email or you change your password for there. Uh, you get a list. It's really actually, it's fascinating and disturbing. Both. And helpful. Start your free trial today at Aura.com slash majority. All right. I uh, want to welcome to the program... Well, we need two seconds. We will bring him in in just a moment. Quick break, and we'll be back with Jefferson Morley, editor of the JFK's fact blog, author of Scorpion's Dance, The President, The Spymaster, and Watergate. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. I want to welcome to the program Jefferson Morley, editor of the JFK's Facts blog, author of Scorpion's Dance, The President, uh, The Spymaster, and Watergate. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us, obviously, here with Emma. Um, this is, uh, it, it is, it is a, a fascinating look at a part of Watergate that, was never really examined. Let's just, I mean, let's back up. Please keep in mind that our audience was probably not alive during Watergate uh, right. for the most part. And, and certainly, um, you know, I don't know how many people know too much about it. But the main thread that we all, to the extent of us that were, were aware of it, um, we heard was through the reporting of uh, Woodward and Bernstein and it had to do with a break in to the DNC uh, headquarters right. uh, by a, a group called the Plumbers. And, and, and uh, ostensibly, um, Nixon was worried about reelection. And, yes. and, and that's the part. And much of it got and that was like the one strand of what was going on that got examined. Will you add to that strand if there's something you feel I left out? But then yeah. talk about the, the sort of the backside. Yeah. So the narrative, the narrative that we have inherited, I would say the dominant Watergate narrative is the one you referred to. And it's embodied in the movie All the President's Men, which follows the reporting of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein into who was this team of burglars. And it turned out they were working for the White House. And kind of the mythic narrative is, you know, a crusading free press takes on a lawless president. And it's a very satisfying myth, especially to journalists like me inspired lots of us to go into journalism. And I went into journalism and discovered that that story is not so much wrong as pretty simplistic. And my book, Scorpion's Dance, kind of lays bare what we've learned in the half century since then, which is that the hidden hand of the CIA was much greater than Woodward and Bernstein never knew. In fact, the, the word CIA only appear once in the movie early on when Jim James McCord, one of the burglars, a former CIA man, tells the court where he's being arraigned for the burglary that he worked for the CIA. There's Woodward in the courtroom. He says, holy shit. And he runs back to the Post newsroom and they put in a call to the CIA. The CIA responds and says, these men are former people and we've had no dealings with them. I, I, just to be clear, let me yeah. just stop you. Sure. Four of the five burglars who were caught were... Former CIA, we're yeah, former -CIA. CIA, right? Is that right? <laughs> Either employees or, or contract employees or officers or assets. Yes, four of the seven were had long seven, standing sorry. ties to the long standing ties to the CIA. So the, the CIA puts out this story. We've had no dealings with these men since their retirement in 1970. And that story, as I show, was a cover story. It was completely false. They had had repeated dealings with James McCord and Howard Hunt, the two leading burglars, who in fact were reporting everything that they learned as burglars back to the CIA. So that story of how the CIA was much more deeply involved than people understood at the time is kind of at the heart of my book. Okay, so now what is the story that we have 
that 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 the the prevailing story as to how those uh, burglars were assembled assembled. Like, what well, was the chain of command as we understood it, at least at the time, before we get to the... the, the yeah, you know, to the, the well, the, 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 what, what Woodward and Bernstein discovered was that the burglars were directed from the White House, um, that the, the, the orders for, uh, you know, the plans, the team was assembled by the White House. But what they didn't know was that, that Howard Hunt, career undercover officer, a uh, leading figure in the CIA's operation to overthrow the government of Cuba, a man who planned assassination of Fidel Castro, was recommended to the White House by Richard Helms, the director of the CIA himself, a year before the burglary. So when Nixon was looking for plumbers to go after unauthorized leaks of information, he was desperately looking for somebody to do. And we now have a phone conversation where the chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, says, well, there's this guy, Hunt, and Helms says, he's ruthless, quiet, and careful. He's on our side. He wants to fight with us. So it was, it was Helms's recommendation that brought Hunt into the Nixon White House. Not the only thing, but it definitely helped him. Okay, let's go back just a moment. Sure. Like, why are they called plumbers? They're, they're finding leaks, but what leaks? So Helms, who was the CIA director at the time, uh, yeah. a, at the time and we're going to get more into that because there's a... Um, it's a very um, noteworthy and strange relationship between uh, Nixon and Helms, uh, based upon sort of like their their personalities and, and right. their profiles. But 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 give us some backstory as to like why the plumbers were first assembled because they weren't assembled to go to, into the Watergate. To, into Watergate, and we should be clear, Watergate is a hotel too. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and so like, just back up and, and give some people that some so, of that remedial information. Well, so when during the Nixon administration, Nixon came to office when the opposition to the Viet war in Vietnam was cresting and, and burgeoning. And Nixon was obsessed with um, spying on the, 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 the anti-war movement, figuring out if they had foreign intelligence collection connections. Um, and he was especially infuriated by the leak of the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times in June 1971. That's when he really went ballistic and demanded the creation of a unit that was not the FBI, which has responsibility for domestic intelligence, and not the CIA, which has responsibility for foreign intelligence, but an entity that would report to him on how these leaks were happening and to punish, to discredit, to impugn the people who were doing the, doing the, the leaking. And so that was how, that was when Helms recommended Hunt to the White House. And that's when they first started going after Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon analyst who had leaked the papers to the White House. So that's why Hunt and his little team were called the plumbers, because they were going to fix the, those leaks on behalf of the White House. All right. And so, um, and so let's get into what was never what well, so why did things end where they ended like the and this is the well, thing so what I guess, happened what happened was that that the the uh the watergate investigation led to the uh the fbi investigation led to the senate investigation which led to the discovery of the tapes the discovery of the tapes led to impeachment proceedings and nixon was forced to resign less than two years later so really the investigation never really continued after that the burglars went to jail and then and then were released from jail. Uh, Nixon was pardoned and the whole thing was kind of dropped. And so the story of who the burglars were and what they were doing was never really reported out. And I show in the book that, you know, Watergate was not the only burglary these guys engaged in. They had a wide variety of national security operations, especially targeting Chile. And Howard Hunt was in Miami in early 1971, long before Daniel Ellsberg became a household name, recruiting the burglars. So we have signs of these other burglaries that they participated in. There were seven different operations against Chilean government offices in New York and Washington. Chile had a very left-wing government that the CIA and the Nixon administration were seeking to overthrow. So the burglars were really a political espionage team sort of sponsored by the CIA or sponsored by the White House and enabled by the CIA. And so the, the CIA wasn't directing the operation. They were just providing a service to the White House. And that brings us to the. OK, the well, well, hold on. Yeah. I, I, we got we got to back up because there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot to. OK, so let's just start with 
there are uh, how many hours of tapes? I, I just want to go through. I just want to set. Uh, I just want to set that table about why the invest because this was not. You know, I remember the Ken Starr investigation, right. which was like we have one thing over here, and we're going to spend the next three or four years going wherever anything takes us. Like we're going to see anything here or there or there, and we're going to follow yeah. it and whatnot. That's not what happened with Watergate, the Watergate investigation. All that happened was there was this one strand that they followed. But was there like, was there any, I mean, I imagine there were staffers who were like, we're going to listen to all these tapes. And uh, well, you know, that really didn't happen until after Nixon was gone. And, mm -hmm. and the material was not available to researchers um, until it was put online by a professor at Texas A&M, Luke Nichter. And so there were f some 4,000. Even the investigators didn't listen to all the tapes? No, they did not. They did wow. not. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, the White House, the, the legal pursuit of those tapes culminated in July 1974 when the Supreme Court ordered Nixon to release nine key tapes sought by the special prosecutors. And one of those was the so-called smoking gun tape of the conversation on June 23rd, 1972, six days after the break-in in which Nixon pressures Helms to stop the FBI investigation of the burglars. And so Nixon resigns two weeks later, and the, really the whole matter kind of gets dropped there. Nixon is pardoned a month after that, and uh, you know the whole thing is not pursued. And so this because story Ford, wasn't really Ford, known. The vice president, who he, Ford didn't want to know. Nobody wanted no. to know. There was nobody who wanted to know anything. I mean, that's the thing is that you need to have a like almost like a political vendetta uh, with a special prosecutor to get get at this stuff. And there was no there was nobody who was like they caught the car. And so end of the end of the you know, end of end of the chase. Well, one thing that is important to understand is that the Watergate scandal kind of evolved into a CIA scandal. And in 1975, with re reports on abuses of power that start with Watergate but are not limited to Watergate, the CIA's mind control experiments were e exposed for the first time. The CIA plots to assassinate foreign leaders. The CIA's spying on the anti-war movement. The CIA reading the mail of Americans. All of these were revealed in the in the aftermath of the Watergate investigation. And so the, the subsequent congressional investigations focused on CIA abuses of power that were not related to Watergate. And I mean, we picked up the story from there, but it was never really told at the time. And that was the, the I'm sorry, that was the church. Just to be clear, that's the, the church, church commission yeah. or committee, I guess. Yes. And um, uh, and they never bothered to listen to those tapes either. It was not a focus of their inquiry. They were their focus was much broader on the CIA's charter and, and unauthorized activities. Things like Cointel Pro and, and yes. You know, okay. But so yeah. when you say there that was not a focus there, that I mean, this might be not your in your work. You may not be able to prove this right, but there's certainly a chance that that lack of focus or lack of, um, you know, uh, due diligence might have been purposeful. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, the CIA was in no hurry to investigate itself. Um, and uh, the, the, the Democrats uh, on the committee, on the church committee, were at pains to maintain a bipartisan, um, uh, you know, cast to their investigation. And oh so they didn't, they didn't want to dwell on Watergate. Also, because the other material was so shocking and new that it, it, Watergate almost paled in comparison to the plots to assassinate foreign leaders or the opening of, of mail or the mind control experiments. All right, so, so let's let's talk about that. I mean, uh, we, you, you touched on briefly what we did in Chile. This is uh, uh, Salvador Allende's uh, government. Um, this is part of, and so the White House was also, I mean, where, where did this fit in? Like, so the White House is looking for a, a squad of guys to go in and get intel in this country about the uh, Yende government? I mean, it, uh, to, 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 to do all sorts of political espionage um, uh, that, that was not authorized under, uh, under, under current U.S. law, and which this was the great frustration of Nixon was he couldn't get J. Edgar Hoover on board. And this is another important thing to understand. People may know J. Edgar Hoover. He was the arch reactionary 
you know, the, repress, the repressive guy of the US government. But in point of fact, during the Nixon administration, it was Hoover who resisted Nixon's desire to expand domestic surveillance. And it was Dick Helms who empowered him and totally supported him. So there was a continuity between Nixon's desire to authorize in law actions against the anti-war movement and his enemies and the extracurricular activities that Dick Helms enabled him to pursue on the side. And the problem was they couldn't get the FBI to do it. So Helms offered these off the book CIA guys who could help the White House accomplish what they wanted. Um, can I just say when, uh, <laughs> uh, when J. Edgar Hoover is the guy saying tap the brakes on your abuses, you know you have a problem, right? I mean, right. What, what, is, what was that? Like, I mean, was that, was that a situation where was that a rivalry between Helms and Hoover or was that uh, Hoover just saying like, you know what? I've, I've looked back on my career of spying on just about everybody in this country and thought, man, maybe we shouldn't do that. No. Um, well, it was a little bit of both. I mean, Hoover was very hostile to the CIA. So sort of if, if the CIA wanted to do it, he would be inclined to say no, just to jerk their chain. Um, but also Hoover was getting old. He was cranky. And he was sensing, you know, the mood of the country was was changing and the, the types of things that Congress and the public had once accepted on the part of the FBI. Hoover was taking, you know, lots of criticism. He was very aware of his reputation in the press. And so he was just more defensive in his old age, whereas Helms was Dick Helms was a true believer. And he encouraged Nixon in all of these, you know, in all of these hardline domestic surveillance policies. He wanted to spy on the anti-war movement. He wanted to empower Nixon. All right. Before we get into some of those other things he did, let's just get going back to the church commission yeah. what, or committee, I should say. Was the church and, and named after Frank Church, who was yeah. the, the head of the committee. Yeah. Was it, I mean, how much of it was we're letting air out of the tires? Like how mm -hmm. much of this was, you know, we're just going to, we're going to let a little air out of the tires. We're going to have like a limited hangout type of situation. Uh, and how much of it was in earnest uh, they were trying to find stuff because it seems odd that you have all of this, like this evidence <laughs> in the form yeah. of all of this, uh, of these tapes. And you're like, eh, so I'm going to have to listen to them. And well, I mean, the Watergate scandal, the, the resignation and pardon of President Nixon forced the election of a, a, a big Democratic majority in the 74 elections. And this was a true reformist class. And they wanted to get the CIA under control. And they substantially changed the regime that governs the CIA. That Congress and subsequent Congresses created the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. They created the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act and the FISA courts so that the, the approval of covert operations was spread more widely in Washington. It wasn't just one man. When Dick Helms was CIA director, all he had to do to get the CIA budget uh, uh, approved was to go to one person, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and say, sir, I want this amount of money. And that the chairman would say, you've got it. And that was the only oversight there was. So Congress wanted to get control over the CIA, but like you say, it also had the effect of protecting and legitimizing the CIA. And, and CIA Director William Colby, who succeeded Dick Helms, that was part of his strategy was, we're going to we're going to disclose our dirty linen in order to protect ourselves, win more credibility in Washington, and actually enhance the ability of the agency to do what it does. And so ironically, Watergate winds up reinforcing or even strengthening the CIA in the Washington scheme of things. Okay, so um, so the the tapes end up getting put online, yeah. and um, uh, researchers start to dig into these tapes, right. and uh, our our super producer Matt Leck puts them to music so that his friends uh, <laughs> listen to them uh, as a as a young man, uh -huh. um, and um, what what did we find here? Like what uh, what what do we realize that Watergate? What we know as Watergate is sort of almost just like one face of a of almost like a like a like a like a like a dice, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, well, Nixon created with with Dick Helms's help a team that operated by their own description halfway between the CIA and FBI. 
a White House team in order to carry out political espionage missions for the White House. So, you know, the, the, the all the president's men narrative of, you know, a lawless president, well, that's not really the full story. It was a lawless president abetted, abetted by a lawless CIA. Um, at one point, and I want to I want to actually read this from the uh, the tapes, because this is uh, where things start to get a little bit um, uh, interesting. And this is um, this is when Nixon is advising Haldeman, who was his chief of staff at the time, how to right. get the CIA director to um, to motivate him to kill the FBI probe into the break in. Right. And this is what uh, Nixon says, and I'm not going to do an impression. <laughs> say, say, and this is him talking to Haldeman and, and advising him what to say. Say, look, the problem is this will open the whole, the whole Bay of Pigs thing. Mm. And the president, mm. and Nixon speaking about himself, just feels that uh, without going into the details, don't, don't lie to them to the extent to say there is no involvement, but just say that this is a sort of comedy of errors, bizarre, without getting into it. The president believes that's going to open up the whole Bay of Pigs thing. That is a threat, isn't it? I mean, that is he's telling them to threaten the CIA. What is the whole Bay of Pigs thing? I mean, I, well, I, so, we so, all know what the, the Bay, I hope uh, we know what the Bay of Pigs is. But what, right, what the, is he talking to? The Bay of Pigs was the failed invasion of Cuba in April 1971, where Fidel Castro smashed the CIA trained invasion force and imposed the most humiliating defeat on the CIA in its existence. But what was Nixon referring to? Well, Haldeman wrote about this in his memoir a few years later. And he said, I believe that when Nixon used that phrase, the whole Bay of Pigs thing, that was a coded way of referring to the assassination of JFK. And in my book, In Scorpion's Dance, I show that Haldeman was right. There is a White House tape that proves exactly that. Now, let me explain the backstory because it, 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 it is a very solid piece of evidence that really confirms what Haldeman said. When Nixon came to office, Haldeman said, let's reopen the JFK investigation because by 1969, there were lots of doubts that the official story of a, you know, a lone gunman was true. And even a hardcore conservative like Bob Haldeman was saying, let's reopen the investigation. Nixon said, no. But he did send his other aide, John Ehrlichman, over to CIA headquarters to meet with Helms and to get from him the CIA's secret files on the Bay of Pigs. Ehrlichman was always puzzled by this. Why was Nixon so interested in the Bay of Pigs? Cuba was not a big issue in American politics. And, and I should just say, because you said 71 yeah. earlier, but Bay of Pigs was in 61. Right. It happened shortly after Kennedy gets into office. There's been, I think, extensive writing that uh, Kennedy was sort of... It bowled over. I'm not sure exactly the institutional momentum that existed in the national security state sort of convinced him to to engage in this. I think is the is yeah, probably the yes. most. Yes, and and, and 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 Nixon was. I mean, Kennedy was furious with the CIA um, after this happened because he felt they'd handed him a bad plan and they'd oversold it. And um, Kennedy mused about splitting the CIA up. Arthur Schlesinger writes a long memo to Kennedy about reorganization of the CIA. So the, the, a profound split emerges between the president and the CIA in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs. So Ehrlichman is going over to get this stuff from, 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 from Helms. And Helms, a, a, a super smooth gentleman, you know, makes excuses, makes small talk. Ehrlichman always comes back empty handed. This happens like three or four times. So in September 1971, Ehrlichman comes back and he tells Nixon, look, he just won't give this stuff to me. He says it's too sensitive. He's only going to share it with you personally. So Nixon calls Helms into the Oval Office in October 1971. And he says, look, Dick, I want to get down to brass tacks. And he says, as for the dirty tricks part of it, that's Nixon's phrase. As for the dirty tricks part of it, I totally approve. I approve. We, over we overthrew him in Guatemala. I approve. We overthrew the government of Iran. I approve. That was a good plan you guys had at the Bay of Pigs. Kennedy screwed it up. What I need is, what I need, he says, Dick, is, and then he uses this phrase. He says, and, and Helms is like, what's this about? And Nixon says, the who shot John Angle. Mm. So when they say, when referring to the Bay of Pigs as a shorthand or as a secret code yeah. to talk about this, right. was that because the CIA establishment 
what they were so disgusted by the way that JFK responded to the Bay of Pigs and was even discussing uh, you know, what they saw him as soft on communism, right? Even maybe before Bay of Pigs, but certainly after. Also, the fact that he was discussing maybe disbanding or 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 altering the CIA in some way. Is there documentation about that being a directly a response to JFK's response after the Bay of Pigs? Well, I think what was going on between Nixon and Helms was <clears throat> that. Nixon understood that the CIA was very vulnerable on the question of who killed JFK. You know, Bobby Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson both privately thought that there was a good chance the CIA was involved in the ambush in Dallas. Former President Harry Truman definitely thought that. He called for the abolition of the CIA after Kennedy's assassination because he thought that the, that the, the assassination emanated from the CIA. So this was a notion that was not public. Nobody would dare talk about this publicly, but among men and women of power, it was well understood that the, the, the CIA was very vulnerable on Kennedy's assassination. And so Nixon's instructions to Haldeman and tell him this might blow up the whole Bay of Pigs thing, he is threatening Helms with some bad stuff might come out about you guys and the death of JFK. It was a very nasty threat. And, and Helms totally understood it. He blows up a very composed, disciplined man, very rare loss of composure. He is furious because he understands just how nasty a threat is. And the point, the point is in the book, the reason to tell this story is, is that those kind of secrets that were not apparent at the time, nobody in the, in the government would talk about doubting the Warren Commission at the time, but they were definitely there and they were part of what was motivating everybody's actions in Watergate. The politics of the assassination are right underneath the surface of the politics of Watergate. And how did they manifest themselves? Like what, like, like, like were there areas where the Watergate investigations wouldn't go because they're like, this is, we don't, we don't need this and we don't go there. I mean, I, I guess, yeah. I, well, uh, uh, speak to this because I, I think that there was, and I have no idea what those things were, but I suspect this dynamic that exists is, is one that is far more durable in our government than we know. So when, for instance, we get like a Mueller investigation there are areas where I think Mueller did not want to go. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, uh, and I think it I think it explain that dynamic. Well, I mean, what happened in, 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 in the case of Watergate in particular was Helms went along. He went he, he sent his deputy to see Patrick Gray, the acting director of the FBI, and, and, and his deputy told Gray, quote, taper off the investigation. And the CIA repeated this line for a couple of weeks. When the FBI asked for that in writing, the CIA people refused and they backed off and Nixon and Helms stopped, stopped, protect, Helms stopped protecting Nixon and started just protecting himself. Um, and so, but, so, uh, so let me ask this. When he starts protecting himself, is that why Nixon ends up getting, uh, like, here's how Nixon's going to go out? Oof. We're going to go uh, out. He's going to go out in these narrow parameters. You know, I don't know that Dick Helms had it out for had it out for Nixon. I think he he shared Nixon's politics. I don't think the CIA was trying to get rid of them. I just think they were they protected themselves at the expense of Nixon. Um, I don't you know, I don't I don't see that the CIA was trying to get rid of Nixon through Watergate. That that was not uh, I didn't see evidence of that. I'll put it that way. Uh, but did they. Did they, you know, realizing that they wanted to make sure that they were not implicated, make it, uh, you know, again, let the air out of the tires by making sure that he had a quicker exit than he might have had? I guess that's the way I'm asking. It. I mean, it, it's apparent that Helms was sympathetic to Nixon, but of course, you know, it's either you or me. And so let's throw him overboard quickly so they don't get to me. Yeah, I you know, I think there's some truth to it. I mean, you know, Watergate turns into a crisis of the national security state as the scandal evolves from a political burglary at the apparent behest of the White House into this wider inquiry into abuses of CIA power. And, you know, 
the CIA is getting questioned and hammered in Congress in a way that it, that it never had been before. So in that, in that time, the CIA's only mode is self-preservation. And, uh, you know, that's what they were doing. Um, in fact, you know, um, after Bill Colby comes in and starts sharing information with Congress in an effort to defuse the controversy and regain credibility, you know, President Ford thinks that he's gone too far and fires him and brings in somebody more reliable, namely former Congressman George H.W. Bush as his CIA director. So the consolidation and protection of the CIA continues right away. And even the, the modified limited hangout strategy of a guy like Colby is abandoned in favor of a much more hardline, uh, you know, uh, we're not going to we're not going to share anything with anybody and we can do what we want. Um, where, what else, where else does the CIA get involved in, um, in, in, in the relationships that, that, that Nixon had, uh, like, uh, with the, with the joint chiefs of staff, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the Nixon white house was a, was a nest of paranoia. And so it, it turned out that, um, you know, the CIA had their own lines into the Nixon White House through um, Howard Hunt and James McCord, both personal friends of Dick Helms. Um, the Pentagon was doing the same thing because Nixon and Kissinger had tightly controlled U.S. foreign policy in their own hands, and they were not consulting with the Joint Chiefs around major strategic initiatives with China and the Soviet Union. And so the 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 the, the Joint chiefs were spying on Nixon as well. They employed a young Navy yeoman to rifle Kissinger's desk after hours and copy all the documents and, and, and feed them back to the Pentagon just so they would know what they were doing. But you have to understand, that was a totally different independent operation from the CIA. The, the Joint chiefs didn't want the CIA involved in that, and the CIA didn't know about it. At least that's what Helm says. I, so, <laughs> is this like? Did this stop? I, I mean, you know, we're you know, I, I, just to be clear, no, you know, and, it's and, not and, like and, we're and, talking about you know, uh, you know, Sam Adams and um, and uh, George Washington, and uh, you know, they would come in, rifle through Sam Adams' uh, personal information, and find out what he was planning, you know, in regards to the British or, or something like that. I mean. Uh, all this happened during my lifetime, and I wonder. Yeah, and, and in fact, and in fact, I mean, you can see a repetition of it. I mean, the CIA enjoyed an extraordinary measure of impunity in its first 25 years of existence. Watergate and the Church Committee brought that impunity to an end and substituted a new regime for ostensible oversight of the CIA, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. But those committees, that oversight didn't prevent the CIA from joining with the Reagan White House and seeking to bypass Congress uh, in the Iran-Contra affair. Um, and it didn't stop the Bush administration from implementing a torture regime. Uh, so, you know, the oversight system changed, but it remained very weak. And the abuses of power and the impunity did continue after Watergate. You know, and that's this is really the problem with, uh, you know, kind of the happy myth of Watergate, you know, crusading pre free press takes on a lawless president. You know, it, it's a very optimistic scenario about what happened. Um, and in fact, you know, it's not what happened. And, uh, you know, it, 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 I think it made people think, especially in the press, and now why you have so much Watergate coverage is, you know, people believe this story and it made them think that our institutions are much stronger than they are. And now we see that they're not that strong and that the, the unusual set of circumstances that led to Watergate and the subsequent investigation of the CIA are not really in a in, in very strong position to you know, resist the authoritarian movement that we see gathering right now. I mean, and, and we should also say that, you know, like the you, you mentioned the torture regime, everybody involved in that torture regime uh, is either now, uh, you know, served as the director of the CIA or is, um, you know, uh, uh, feeded on uh, television. I mean, there was no accounting for that, regardless of the administration, the subsequent administrations. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I would say, you know, this story about how the CIA had a much greater hand in Watergate is a cautionary tale of how the CIA's hand 
you know, can be hidden in, you know, in major events and completely escape any kind of accountability at all. Um, you know, that's what we can learn from this. Um, where, so what are the major, like, I mean, what, what were, were there areas that the church commission sort of avoided or, or committee, I should say, avoided or the Watergate investigators sort of consciously avoided? Um, I mean, what, what is out there, you know, when he, when he's talking about dirty tricks, the hanky panky, uh, mm -hmm. I'm speaking about, you know, uh, Nixon, um, uh, speaking, um, all that stuff that he knew about. Well, first off, how did he know? Well, Nixon had been deeply involved in Cuba policy at the end mm. of the Eisenhower administration. Um, Fidel Castro comes to power on January 1st, 1959, uh, with a, a popular leftist government, but not communist. Um, and, um, Eisenhower didn't really, President Eisenhower didn't really care Cuba was not important strategically um, in any way or economically. And so Eisenhower didn't really care. But Nixon, looking to run for president in 1960 and being more uh, uh, vehemently anti-communist, appoints himself as point man uh, on Cuba policy in 1959 and 1960. And Nixon knows all about the assassination plots against Castro. And so he does go way back in this. He knew all about the planning for the Bay of Pigs. And so did Helms. So that was the place where the two men's paths first crossed. And, you know, that was something that Nixon had to, you know, keep under wraps. That was one of the things that he and Helms had to keep under wraps. The Castro assassination plots, how the Castro assassination plots related to Kennedy's assassination. This was the, you know, this was the very volatile secret at the heart of their relationship. I, I got to say, it's a very sweet relationship. They both are ideologically aligned and both willing to basically shared um, values. They have shared yeah. values. But Nixon is uh, willing to leverage uh, essentially Helms and blackmail Helms, essentially. And Helms is perfectly willing to uh, throw over Nixon if it uh, <laughs> means saving his. It's it's a uh, it's like a. It's like a, it's a very sweet relationship mm. between the two of them. The, the two wicked Richards, yeah. I mean, uh, two very devious, um, uh, calculating men, um, you know, friends and enemies at the same time. Uh, and, and this plot to, to assassinate Castro, obviously unsuccessful, is, and I'm returning to this just because I think it's such a key point, the failure to continue to pursue that path during the Kennedy administration as Castro kind of consolidates his power and is less vulnerable, is that the ultimate unforgivable sin for the CIA and by extension Nixon? Well, the CIA plots to assassinate Castro continue throughout the Kennedy administration. In fact, Dick Helms is running one of them on the day Kennedy is killed. He has a man delivering a murder weapon in Paris on November 22nd, 1963. So Kennedy never cut that off and he might not have even known about it at all. But what was unforgivable about the, about the, to the CIA men was that, that, that Kennedy refused to invade and overthrow Castro despite having two opportunities, first at the Bay of Pigs and second during the missile crisis. And that was really what was unforgivable. And I think what led to, ultimately led to his assassination. Do you think uh, that Nixon had um, unique information or specific information about Kennedy's assassination? No, no, I, 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 I think that it, it, it's actually more perverse than that. I think he was begging Helms to tell him. The president, he says, he says to Helms, how can it be that the president doesn't know and the director of the CIA does? Where does that leave us? He's almost plaintive. It's almost like Helms is the superior power and Nixon is the supplicant trying to figure out what happened. Tell me, tell me what happened. And he's saying, I'll lie about it. I'll cover up for you, but you got to tell me. And so the dynamic is actually the reverse of what you might think, the president facing down his spy chief. It's almost like Nixon was begging his spy chief for the story. And so there was information that Helms had about the assassination that he felt was too sensitive uh, to give to Nixon or was would provide Nixon with too much power over something else. 
it, yeah, it, it would have given him too much leverage. And, 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 and the one thing he had to hide was the thing I just mentioned, the fact that he himself was running an assassination operation against Castro that day. You know, that's what they hid from the Warren Commission. And that didn't come out until until three years later, until 1975. So that was the, the very, the, uh, one CIA historian called it the sore spot, <laughs> the ultimate uh, understatement. It was a very, very sore spot for Dick Helms. It was a threat to his career and his reputation and, and you know, and possibly, you know, uh, 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 going to prison. I mean, it was a very dangerous situation that, that Nixon was evoking. Helms takes all this. I mean, is he is he is he still with us these days? I imagine uh, he's, he's... Uh, Dick, Dick Helms was the only CIA director ever convicted of a crime. He lied to Congress about an assassination plot, uh, a, a, a successful assassination plot that he that Nixon ordered and he carried out. They assassinated a, a, the top general in Chile in 1970 in an effort to prevent the leftist president Salvador Allende from coming to president. The assassination succeeded, but they did not stop Allende from coming to power. Nixon lied about that. It was a very nasty piece of work, and, and the whole story never really came out. My book is the fullest account of how Helms and his henchmen pulled off that assassination. So, you know, that was something that 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 was had to be hidden right from the start. Um, Helms was, uh, after his conviction, his CIA compatriots rallied. He had a small fine, a couple of thousand dollars, which they paid for him. And uh, he retired as a slightly notorious, but ultimately respectable eminence grease of Washington, um, advised the Reagan administration and the Clinton administration on various things. And he died in uh, 2002. Um, is there anything else that you think that we should um, we, we should know about this, uh, this relationship or, or what Helms was well, up to? You know, you know, people ask me a lot about like, so, and understandably so, you know, so what does this have to do with January 6th? So I was on, a, I was on with a pro-Trump radio host last night and he was like, you know, like was the CIA behind, you know, setting up President Trump? And I said, no, you know, there's no evidence of that. That's not the relevance of it. I, I think the relevance of this story is, is that when you have a corrupt president and a lawless agency that is working with a corrupt president, you're in a very dangerous situation. And I think that this is something that people underappreciate about our current situation. People see the CIA and the CIA former leadership as being quite hostile to Trump. And, and that is true. Those former heads of the CIA are very hostile to him. They regard him, him as a threat to the country and to their agency in particular. But rest assured, there are plenty of people in the CIA who sympathize with Donald Trump. And if Trump becomes president again and gets control of the CIA, that is a much more dangerous situation than anybody has contemplated, I don't, I think. And that's the, that's the relevance of Watergate is we see a, White House, a corrupt White House and a lawless agency working hand in hand in the domestic sphere. They got caught and both Helms and Nixon suffered the consequences. But if President, if Trump is elected again in 2024 and gets control of the CIA, then we're going to be in a very different place. This is about people having um, a lack of imagination, I guess, or frankly, a lack of of an, just an awareness of the reality of what took place during that time. Right. And, 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 and so, I mean, I didn't set out to write this book with that thing. I just knew there was a lot of new information out there. But as I as I as I reflect on what I learned in writing the book and what its relevance is now, you know, that's something that I don't think people have thought about is a, that the CIA could come under cr Trump's control and what the implications of that would be. Well, well OK, so let me just uh, ask one more question with that sure. in mind. Was it just like, well, what ultimately was the breaks on that? Right. Was it just that they, it wasn't just that they got caught? Right. Because. No, it was it was the cultural revolution. It was it was the cultural revolution that was happening in the late 1960s and 1970s and changing the deferential stance of Congress and the press. And so people were no longer willing to have confidence in these government institutions, which had proven to be deceptive around the war, around Kennedy's assassination, around Watergate. People were just fed up with being lied to. And so it was really the cultural transformation 
that put the check on the agency. Um, we don't that have that now. We, no, we don't I, have anything like that. Like I say, you know, uh, John Brennan is on uh, uh, on, you know, MSNBC. Uh, I don't know where he is. You know, maybe yeah. he could be on a different network by now. I don't know. But they're all, th you know, the clappers on like they all all of these figures are considered statesmen and they're still going to defend the institution, regardless of the fact that Trump could get in there second time around. He understands like. Hey, wait a second. There's a lot more I can get away with, and I have a lot more power. Because he sort of got, he started to feel those oats, you know, like the, the third or fourth year that he was president. He would come in with that understanding, and God knows where he would be exponentially three or four years into it. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, and I think all of those guys who are, all of those CIA formers, you know, uh, have not acknowledged the possibility that they're, you know, their underlings and former subordinates at the CIA may well go to Trump you know, uh, and, and just decide, you know, that's the, that's the, where the president goes. You know, Dick Helm said, you go with the president or you get out of the executive branch. I mean, that is the mode at the CIA. And so this idea that because these former guys are standing up to Trump and they don't like him and they're personally offended by him, I don't think that they've really examined the institutional realities of their situation. Yeah, unless you're JFK or unless, I mean, and this is, I, I know we're taking up some, a lot of your time, but it's just an interesting thought experiment about, you know, how close Bernie Sanders got in 2016, what the reaction from the CIA would have been if there was an actual Democratic Socialist president who was threatening to really win. Um, well, I, 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 I think that we would see, um, I mean, uh, I think that we would see the kind of offensive that they launched against Trump. I mean, I don't think they'd have as much ammunition because Bernie's not corrupted by or wasn't seeking favors from foreign nationals. That's not his style. But I think that, you know, uh, you would have a lot of leaks of, from the intelligence community trying to discredit a, you know, a Sanders presidency. That's the reality of the CIA as a power player in the constellation of Washington institution. Too often we just think of the government as the White House. There's a, a whole array of different, they're kind of different mountains. In, in, if you think of the US government as a mountain range, you know, the CIA is one peak and the White House is maybe a slightly bigger peak, but these are big mountains. They don't move, you know, they, that landscape doesn't change. And that's, that's another thing that Watergate tells us, you know, look at the CIA and the kind of impunity that they enjoyed in 1972 and favorable press coverage, you know, and today they have a lot of impunity and they have a lot of favorable press coverage. Jefferson Morley, editor of the JFK Facts blog, author of Scorpion's Dance, The President, the Spy Master, and Watergate. Thanks so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that in uh, the podcast and YouTube description. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. All right, folks. We're going to head into the uh, fun half of this program. That will be my uh, passive aggressive Father's Day gift for the year. What's that? <laughs> that book. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be as effectively passive aggressive if you, oh, but your dad's not listening today. No. He's not ever, ever, never. Good luck hanging up your flag, Dad. <laughs> Read like this book. Move on. I just like the idea that, like, oh, while no, we're gonna go deep into this, <laughs> while all this CIA stuff's going on, also the Joint Chiefs of Staff has their own spy just <laughs> rifling. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. It's like a comedy almost. Like yeah. should, somebody should do like an office style mockumentary, yes. but just like real stuff that happened in the sixties. It, it and 70s. feels like a, like a Peter Sellers type of like comedy from like the the, the late sixties. You know, is there anybody here not like a, you feel like Benny Hill music right, in the right. background? <laughs> Where the president walks out, someone from the Joint Chiefs of Staff goes in, ruffles to his desk, he comes back like in. Spies bumping into each yeah. other. <laughs> one shuts the door, the other one opens up the closet and walks out and turns on the tape. Two kids in a trench coat. <laughs> They're all like, um, good you know, stuff. Piling up at the, uh, the um, what do they call that thing where you develop film? The, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the dark room. The dark room. Yeah. Spy film. Yeah. The dark room. Wow. Dark room. Oh, God, I feel old. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, uh, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only get the free show free of commercials, you get the fun half. And you allow this show to survive and thrive. Members make up the overwhelming majority of our revenue. Somewhere in the 
high 80s to low 90s. I don't know. I make up the number every day because I don't, I don't know the percentages of oil, but, but it's high, <coughs> super high. Uh, and uh, you keep us afloat. If you're one of those people who can't afford a, uh, a Fun Half membership, send us an email right in the subject line, Fun Half. Wait a couple of weeks, and we will get there, and we will uh, work something out with you. Uh, join the majorityreport.com. Also, don't forget, justcoffee.coop. Fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. It's great coffee. They got a cold brew. You can get the MR blend. Um, great company. Great coffee. Check it out. What is happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Yeah, for uh, Left Reckoning patrons, we did a think tank for an hour and a half. Uh, we'd, also, we'd take your questions and uh, voicemails. We also talked about the Overstock CEO being lonely at lunch because uh, he says he opened up during the pandemic. Like On Tuesdays, you can go eat lunch with the Overstock.com CEO, mm. and only 10 employees have taken him up on that. And isn't it so bad at how people aren't willing to... Only 10 brown-nosing losers. Yeah, I, and I like the idea that like Tuesdays is the day that I'll condescend to meet with you plebs and yeah. can watch me eat. But yeah, so patreon.com says left reckoning to get access to the think tank. Oh, incidentally, don't forget tomorrow, guys. <laughs> meet in the commissary. Oh, right. <laughs> One out of four in attendance. <laughs> if we attendance. had lunch during this time block, that would be a huge for me. Eat on air, I'm already imagine. starting to get hungry. It's uh-huh. an issue for me. I don't really get it. <laughs> Go See? on. See you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun Matt. You. Fun What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No, me key. You did it. Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's- Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight. Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go throw up. Who libertarians? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him! So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge met. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35501 One half. 38. 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. $6,543 trillion. Sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, uh, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I I don't know. But you should know. People the, the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, this, Look, um, gotta jump. I gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. <laughs> um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye.
We are back, ladies and gentlemen. It is...